Okay, great. Well, thank you very much for joining me today. My name is Nicole Higgins and I am the Buy and Retail Coach. I'm talking today about inventory sourcing and what you need to know. It will be recorded and all the views and everything I'm talking about are my own and represent what I think in my experience that I have um, gained over the last 18 years working um, for retailers and sourcing products. So let's um, let me just get started. Oops. Great. So a little bit about me, I have 18 years experience working as a buyer for companies like Primark, Marks and Spencers, Debenhams and some smaller boutiques as well. I've sourced products from all over the world, from UK to Europe to Far East, places like Vietnam, Brazil, Sri Lanka, China. And I've introduced lots of new products into the markets that I've worked in across a broad spectrum of product types from lingerie, health and beauty and homewares. And now I work with entrepreneurs and startups to help them start and scale their product business. So that might be looking at where they can find suppliers. It might be helping them with their strategy. It might be looking at their pricing with them. And I'm also the host of the Start, Scale, Succeed podcast. I recently released the 100th episode with that. Um, and there I chat with entrepreneurs and experts about their journey or about something that's going to help people that are starting and scaling their product businesses. Now, today we are going to talk about key ways to source products for your business. So we'll look at suppliers, how to search, what to look for and what to ask, pricing, what goes into your cost price, how to calculate it and the margins you want to aim for, working with suppliers, what you need to know. Let me just move this down here. And then uh, we're looking at going to look at UK and overseas manufacturer as well. So very quickly, what I want to go through some things that it's important for you to understand and be aware of before you start sourcing, because they affect what you're going to buy they affect the price points you're going to pitch things at and they are going to affect um your your overall customer as well so you want to understand your why your customer your competition so with your why this includes kind of your mission what you do who you do it for and why you do it and i've got some examples of other businesses to quickly kind of illustrate for you what this is your vision would be what your bigger picture is for the business and your values. So think about this as the personality of your brand. So just choosing two very different examples here to help illustrate this point a little bit better for you. So you have mission statements. So we've got Nike and LinkedIn. So like I said, two very business, different businesses. So Nike's mission is to bring inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the world. And their, their feeling and their thought is if you, are, if you have a body, you are an athlete. So they want to talk to you, whether you are, you know, someone that can run like Usain Bolt or whether you're doing couch to 5k. So they're, and their strap line is just do it. So, and their vision is for everything, do everything possible to expand the human potential. So we see how that's the, the bigger idea and their values are innovation, inspiration, being connective and being distinctive. So if you think about all their communication, their advertising, that is very um, prevalent in, in, how they, in how they do that. And then you've got LinkedIn and their mission is to connect the world's professionals to make them more productive and successful. So if you think about what LinkedIn is and how it does that, then it fulfills that mission. Its vision is to create, and you can see again how this is the bigger picture, to create economic opportunity for every member of the global workforce. And their values are respect, compassion, honesty, and integrity. So understanding that for your own business helps create that foundation as well. And then you want to think about your customer, what age range they are, what are their shopping behaviors, what are their habits, how they shop, where they shop, how often they shop, the brands that they like and the kind of income they have and what they're influenced by. So building that picture of your customer in your mind when you're sourcing your products and when you're sourcing the suppliers for your products. And then you want to look at your competition because we all have competitors and um, they may not be in your vicinity, but they're all, there is always competition. So have a look at their price points because understanding where their price points are, you'll help understand where you need to pitch your price points as well. Um, who their customer is, how their customer is different to yours, looking at their branding, looking at their social media, their email marketing, their products, where their brand is positioned and what their unique selling point is. And that, and then look at, your own version of that then as well where are your price points what's your customer how are you different so and when i talk about brand positioning this is just kind of two examples here you can see um 
where you're positioned on a map, you know, so if you look at this, I'll just this image here, you've got a low price and high price on one axis and low quality versus higher quality on another. So you can see Zara is high price, higher quality, m and high price, higher quality. And then where you've got Boohoo, which this is a bit of perception, you might have uh, low price, low quality. So just thinking about where your brand is positioned. And often when you're looking at this and when you're starting out, if there's a real gap in a certain area, that could be where their potential is as well. So, like I said, that's very quickly running through that, but I wanted to establish those, that with you before I started on sourcing because it does affect everything. So I'm going to presume now that you're clear on your pricing structure in terms of what where you're, where you're positioning your pricing within your products, um, where your brand is positioned, what your unique selling point is, you're clear on your customer, you understand your why, and you understand your why. So ways to buy products for your business. So with products for your business, you can get branded, you can get white label, you can have own label or slash made to order and you can do drop ship as well. So if you, it would be great to, if you can put in the chat for me what you are looking for. And I'm gonna go through um, and explain these a little bit more as well, but are you looking for branded? Is it white label that you want? Are you looking for you know, distinctive exclusive pieces? Or are you looking at dropship? So pop those in the chat for me as well as we go along. So branded is the products aren't exclusive to you unless that's agreed and it carries another company's branding. They're usually bought through a distributor or a wholesaler and direct or direct from the brand itself. Then you've got what's called white label. So this could be, you'll see a lot of the clothing does this, like say t-shirts where you print um, you know, a, a logo on or a brand on, and that's a product that's already made. It's you buy it off the shelf essentially, and uh, you've got a specific range that you can choose from. You can add your labeling and packaging. So if it's clothing, you can add printing. If it's embroidery or embroidering, if it's skincare, they might have the formulation, and you just put it in new packaging. And then you have um, made to order. So product is made specific to your requirements. It's exclusive to you, and it has higher minimums. And then than the other options and you can do um you can do a, a variety of these as well and then you have dropship where you don't own the goods people place an order through your website but the order comes to the brand directly to the consumer and you would get a commission on that so where can you find suppliers and i'm going to go through um, a variety. I'm going to go through all of these as we as we go through. So you've got LinkedIn, which is a business to business platform. Online searches such as Google, Instagram, Pinterest, TikTok, marketplaces, which I'll discuss. A variety of trade fairs. So there are trade fairs for every type of product uh, that you can think of. I've just listed a few of them here. But if you just Google trade fairs, children's wear trade fairs, denim, whatever it is, trade fairs, homeware, you'll, you'll, they will come up. But these are some just some examples. Spring and autumn fair are multi-product, lots of gifting. Top drawer is multi-product gifting. It's not clothing. Cosmoprof is cosmetics. Pity Bimbo is kids wear. Isle of Playtime is kids wear. Hintex is homeware. Pure is clothing. Canton fair is in China and it's a variety. It's just, it's huge. And there's a whole load of products there. And then you've got Mecam and Mepel, which are in Italy and they are footwear and accessories. But like I said, they are just a fraction of what is available. And then you have some sourcing websites, uh, which I will go through in a minute. But Common Objective, Alibaba, Make It British, Resource Fashion. There's some. There are definitely more than that as well. And then you have some industry-specific websites, Open Apparel Registry being one of those, depending on what kind of product you're looking for and what stage you're at. So looking at LinkedIn, um, the way that you use LinkedIn, first of all, I would say, make sure that you have your own profile set up and that you have a photograph in that profile. If you are messaging a supplier through LinkedIn, you know, it's, they're going to respond a lot better if they can, that you have a, so that you have a profile and that you've got a photograph on there, but be specific with what you're searching. And you can see, I don't know if you can see very well here, but if I just put in candles into LinkedIn, I get six and a half thousand results. So obviously that is way too many. So, but if I put in candles I look by companies and I search United Kingdom then I have it narrows it down to 30 and then you can have a quick kind of scan through that to see right who are the where is the manufacturers on this who do I want to who do I want to focus you could also put in candle manufacturers and then um 
select companies and United Kingdom or whichever country that you want to source a product from. Um, so LinkedIn is a really useful tool for you to, to use. Often people on LinkedIn don't check their direct messages. So you could get the details and then contact them directly from the website, but it's a good way to kind of, to look at everything in one place. And then you have trade fairs. Now, since the pandemic, one of the good things that came out of that is a lot of the trade show websites have um, up their game in terms of the information that you have on it and the information that the suppliers and the exhibitors put on that. So whether you're going in, in real life or you're looking at online, if you're looking online, then you can filter by the location, you can filter by the type of product that you want. And um, you, know, you get a lot, then you would basically be going through and looking at those suppliers and then again, going on the internet and searching a little bit more about them and reaching out to them. Looking for suppliers and sourcing suppliers does take time and it does take research. So, and to not get overwhelmed with it, make sure that you're, you know, you're keeping an Excel spreadsheet for yourself. You've, you're making notes on who you want to contact, when you've contacted them, what you do, because if not, you're just gonna, it's just gonna be like, oh my God, who have I spoken to? Um, you know, what do they do again? So trade shows are really, really good. So if there's any, and I can answer this lately, um, later on, but if there's any particular trade shows or a product that you're looking for, um, pop it in the, uh, the question in the Q&A and I can let you know a, a trade show that I would recommend for you to kind of look at online um, and visit virtually or go, go and see if you can. So with the trade shows, they are, um, you know, you'll have lots, if you haven't been to a trade show before, there's, it will be, it's a hall, it's many halls and areas of stands and the supplier is exhibiting their products there. Um, so you get to see a lot in one place. Oops. And then you've got sourcing websites. So some of the sourcing websites that I've looked at, so you've got Common Objective. This is one that has very much a sustainability focus. So all of the suppliers on Common Objective Objective before they're hosted on that platform will have to answer questions to um, about sustainability and um, so generally the suppliers on common objective are all over the world uh, but it has a sustainability focus you've got companies like um, Alibaba AliExpress and that's just a little difference there about you know what the difference are between Alibaba and AliExpress so Alibaba um, it's lower quantities AliExpress is the higher quantities um they're both um alibaba's business to business um they are you know they have you can do private label products you can do white label products and then another one that you can have a look at is one called resource fashion which is just for clothing and they do lots of small quantities as well but dealing with china but if you use google and we'll come to we'll come to google and search engines in a moment but if you put in sourcing websites into that it will bring up um sourcing websites um yeah, I think if you just use that as your search initially, then that would bring um, that would bring up quite a lot there. Okay, and then yeah, that's just what uh, sourcing playground, which is another one, and then you've got Alibaba as well. Also, more and more people are now using social media. More and more manufacturers are using social media um, to talk about their brand to show the process. So if you go on TikTok, or, um, Instagram. Also Clubhouse, uh, I'm not sure how many people are still using Clubhouse, but use hashtags. Um, so China manufacturer, clothing manufacturer, uh, homewares manufacturer, um, China supplier, things like that. And it will bring up quite a few um, candle manufacturer. I saw one on TikTok the other day. It's got 11,000 followers and it is literally a, a China manufacturer that I actually know talking about their process and showing the different processes. So they're a really good, um, they're a really good resource for you to, you know, see quite easily what they do and what they're about. So using, using the hashtags of China manufacturer, when you find those suppliers as well, look at the hashtags that you're, they're using because there are other hashtags then that you could search on your, when you're on Instagram or TikTok, um, also on Pinterest as well. Um, Clubhouse, I have been in before and I have seen there's a lot of kind of conversations about manufacturing rooms. So often the hosts there are, man, are suppliers or the people that are listening um, are, are suppliers as well. So you can you could reach out and contact them or you can ask questions within within the group, within the, within the Clubhouse meeting. Um, I'll come to the, so in terms of trade shows, just some of the questions that have come through on 
the homewares one. So homewares, um, if you're looking for UK suppliers, um, I would say um, top drawer would be one and um, the autumn and spring fair, depends on what kind of homewares that you're looking for, but definitely top drawer and um, it's just kind of a spring fair and autumn fair. Uh, so they're UK ones that you can have a look at. Um, if you want to go further afield, there's one in Germany called Time Tex as well. And um, Rebecca, I'll come back to your point about uh, period pants and knickers. They would be something that would be made to order. There's a lot of sourcing and testing that goes into that. I know because I've worked for a brand that does it, um, but I will come back to that question. And if there's any questions as we go through that you want more detail of, just you can follow me on Instagram at the Byron Retail Coach and um, I can, we can have a, a DM conversation as well. But let's try and keep as much as we can in here for now um, and that I can get through them. So yeah, social media is great for you to use. Use the hashtags, um, follow the people, look at the people that, look at the hashtags they're using and then research those hashtags as well. And Google is your best friend as well in terms of looking for suppliers. So if you just put, you could put in I, like an example here, I've got Candle Manufacturers UK. Um, you could put in Candle Manufacturers plus UK or Candle Manufacturers plus China. It could bring up other ones for you, depends where you want to source from. Um, and then the, another company, which is a couple of other ones to look at, which is Open Apparel Registry. So this is, it will give you the names of the factories Often it doesn't have websites. You then have to go onto Google to, to have a look at the website. But if you really love the brand, so Rebecca, I'll take your point in terms of you're looking for to source period pants, knickers and menstrual cups. So you could go into um, Open Apparel Registry. You could put in, you could put in a brand's name. And if they're registered with this site, it's about, this is about suppliers being and brands being transparent. You could put in a brand's name and then you could see where their factories are, what their factories are. So an example here is, oops, if I look here, an example here is the brand Ghani. I've put in, so if you see filter by contribution type, I've put in the brand and um, I can't remember whether I put in the product type, whatever, but then it brought up different factories that that brand works with. Um, other ones, if you're looking for more like artisan types products, um, look at the World Trade Organization, they'll work with uh, countries like Africa and India as well. Um, and also the British Chamber of Commerce or the Chamber of Commerce of the region that you want to um, work with. They will often have either events or kind of a directory of sources. One thing that I haven't mentioned here, if you're looking for uh, UK manufacturers, um, Make It British is a is run by a lady called Kate Hill, Kate Hill, and she has a lot of experience in and a great directory of over, I think, probably over 150 um, manufacturers in the UK from um, candles, stationery, clothing. So um, that is also a great resource for you to have a look at if you're looking for products that are made in the UK. So not products that are imported into China, but ones that are made in the UK. OK. Okay, let's see. So then if you are looking for branded products, um, some of the areas that you can find that, and, and brands that you can white label, um, marketplaces. So ones like if you've heard of FAIR, so that's F-A-I-R-E, Anchor Store, um, Creo 8 is another one. And FAIR is great because you've got everything in one place. They often, they give the buyers such as yourselves, credit terms for 30 days, which the brands can't offer. Often if you're joining them for the first time, they might give you free shipping from the States. Um, so definitely ones for you to, to look at that you wouldn't be able to buy from them unless you have a website um, either started or, um, or already launched because um, that's one of their requirements of what they need. Um, and then Nolene has um, recommended, there's another website called Let's Make, uh, Let's Make It Here. Uh, for sourcing but there are you know there are definitely other sourcing websites so a good google search will help you with that as well i've just um talked about a couple of them here and, and karen you're looking for sourcing fashion pieces for your online boutique um so depending on what you're looking for the trade shows such as pure uh would be one that are in the uk um but there's other ones in paris it, it really depends on the kind of price point that you want to go for as well and what, and what type of white label product that you want. Um, 
but marketplaces are great for gifting. Um, they have some clothing on them, but gifting, candles, stationery, uh, pet accessories is a real variety. Um, yeah, and Mandy has just said the fair is amazing. You get inside a membership, uh, free shipping and duties if you if you opt for a certain um, package there. But it is very, very easy to use and, and a great website. So definitely, so fair, F-A-I-R-E is one to have a look at. And then looking at um, sourcing, whether you're talking about the UK, Far East or um, Near East. So advantages with the UK, generally you can buy smaller quantities, so tens, you know, but with that, you, you're paying more per, per item. You've got the ease of logistics. You can go and see the factory. You can go and see it where it's made. You can use it in your marketing. And also because you're buying smaller quantities, you can test it quickly, you can repeat it so that you're, you know, and your cash flow is, you're not having all your cash flow tied up in stock. Um, and because of Brexit, you're not having to deal with that because you're buying from the UK, but you will have a higher label cost. So it, that's one of the things why you need to decide at the beginning. And this is one of the misconceptions people have is, oh, I'll get my cost first and I'll decide on what my retail prices need to be. It, what you want to do is where do I want to pitch my retail prices? And then that says, right, OK, if I want to pitch my retail prices here, the UK is possible for me or the UK is not possible for me based on um, the kind of cost prices that you would get back from the suppliers. And then if you're looking at Europe and the Near East, um, Portugal, Spain, Turkey, Egypt, Morocco, Macedonia, medium sized quantities, um, you can do quick repeats. You do have Brexit ramification, ramifications, so you will have to pay customs and duty. And I'll go through in a moment the kind of um, things that you not need to add on into your costs if you're bringing products in. But generally, depending on the factory, Portugal and Spain would be looking for anything between 50 to 200 to 500 items um, or units per item. Um, Turkey, usually 200 to anything, 200 to thousands, and same kind of with Egypt and Morocco as well. So they are, they would be classed as medium sized quantities. Um, you know, if you're looking for something that's lower than that, I would, I would advise you to try and do branded or white label first to make sure that, um, you know, that there is a market there that people have got what you want. Um, or just, or just limit the amount of products that you're actually going to develop. And then you have the Far East, so China, areas like China, Vietnam, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, um, all good for different things. So uh, China, you can get, you know, absolutely everything from there. Um, it has cheaper labor, but it does have a longer lead time and a shipping time. So depending on what your, um, your product is, you can be looking at between 60 to 90 days of getting some things made. Sometimes it could be quicker. It really just depends on your factory and they have to put it, they have to plan it into their production. Um, generally larger quantities. So the minimums I've seen coming out of the Far East are 500s. But again, you know, I know, I know people that uh, work with um, factories and work with their sample rooms. So there is an underwear brand, this sustainable underwear brand called Panty and they, um, work with the sample room of the factory initially when they first started because it was much smaller quantities so a lot of like when you're sourcing it's about building that relationship with the supplier as well and seeing you know if they see the potential in you and that's one of the things I would say when you're reaching out to suppliers don't go like straight into the questions and we'll come into the questions in a minute but give a little bit of a background of who you are what your business is about you know if you're already if you're already being established um, they know that you're, you know, that you're serious, that you've been in business a while. Um, they don't want to be spending a lot of time on people that may not may not take things forward. So just get a little background of who you are, how long you've been in business, what you're what you're doing, what your plan is, what you want to do, and see then if they're if you're a good fit. So far east, cheaper labor, but longer lead time and shipping time. So you can take um, depending on whether you fly it in or whether you um, see it in, it can be like three to six weeks if you're bringing it in overseas. And then you have the logistics of landing and bringing the product, which I'll come to in a minute, um, generally larger quantities. You have currency fluctuations as well. So if you're buying from China, Vietnam, Sri Lanka, all of those countries, you're gonna be buying in US dollars. So um, you, depending on what the dollar rate is, will depend on what kind of margin that you will make out because you'll have to uh, use your exchange rate. 
And then you have freight charges that go on top of that as well. So around the pandemic, freight went from, you know, it used to be like £2,000 to bring in a container that would be split across a couple of people to bring in a, a 40 foot container. But I think that basically it quadrupled or more in price. So all of that goes on to your cost price and affects your margin. Um, let me just see. Let me kind of let's see. Um, and Sandrine has asked about the quality. Is that reliable from the Far East? Yeah, absolutely. It all depends on who you're working with and the quality that you set out. And these would be some of the questions that you would ask them when you're working with them. So we'll come to that in, in a minute, Sandrine, about the quality. Um, I've worked with the Far East for, for years and I've been in the same factories that Mark Jacobs works in um, and that Primark works in. It's all about um, setting the standards. It's all about what your expectations are, you know, the testing that you need to do as well. But we'll come to that in a moment. So some of the things for you to ask suppliers. So what is their minimum order quantity or minimum order value? So if you're buying branded like on um, fair or at a trade fair, they'll usually have a minimum order value. And depending on what the product is, it can be some, sometimes they don't, but generally it might be like 250 pounds and, um, or it could be like 1500 pounds if it's clothing or a thousand pounds if it's clothing. Um, and then a minimum order quantity, like I said, if you're, you know, the UK, it could be 10. Um, it could be the, for the UK, it could be 10. For China, it could be 500, depending on what you're buying. For the for the for Europe, it could be 200. So that would be one of the questions that you would ask for. What's their production and sample lead time? So essentially, lead time is how long it's going to take them to get it to, you know, how long it's going to take them to make it. So the production lead time and the sample lead time will be different. So it might get them take them two weeks to get you a sample because they'll maybe making it in the sample room, or it and then it will take them depending on what the product is 30 60 90 days for them to actually do the production because they fit it in to um to your products um and then karen's asked question about to clarify what was marketplace a sourcing place or a gene generic reference place so a marketplace are companies like fair and creo 8 um they are a a platform that that brands sell their products on and then they they give a commission to that marketplace to fair so they pay um, a certain amount to, to to fair so that's for when you're buying like a, either branded or white label products you would usually find there um, and then Jeff you're talking about wholesalers for brands like Nike Adidas you would want to contact them specifically they will have something on their website that says do you want to stock our brand Nike have really restricted who they sell to so um, unless you're quite established. I don't think you would get Nike. They've uh, really brought that in, um, in terms of who they supply to, but um, they may have, dis you know, not Nike, but if you go on their website and it will, it will be, do you want to be a stockist? If you look on the bottom of people's websites, it will say they might have a wholesale email or it might be, do you want to be a stockist? What I would say often, those, um, those websites, those emails aren't often monitored. So if you don't get an answer, don't be disheartened just ring, contact them directly in a different way, get through to their customer service. Um, I, and I know that from personal experience of trying to contact them already. And this is um, the Creo 8 is the other one. Oh, sorry, it's Creo 8. Um, I'm gonna come back to the questions um, in a little bit as, as well, because we won't get through everything if we keep just going on the questions. Um, but yeah, so questions to our suppliers, Minimum order quantity, production and sample lead times, and what are their payment terms? So do not work unless you're buying branded products. So if you're buying from a brand and it's the first time they've worked with you, they'll want payment up front. Um, after they work with you maybe once or twice, they might give you, they'll extend to maybe 30 days credit terms. If you're working for a manufacturer and um, they're making something made to order for you, they'll need a deposit. And that should be between 30 to 50% deposit. Do not accept if they ask for 100% deposit because that's not, they might want it, but it's not an industry norm. You don't have to do that. So 30 to 50% deposit if you're getting something that's specifically made for you. But if it's a brand, generally they'll want, um, they'll want, they, they need 100% um, payment or fund pro forma. Um, you might want to ask about what audits do the factories have. If you're working with a small, so audits are like a, um, 
a quality check, an ethical check. And there's certain companies like Stedex is one, BSCI is another, and they give the factory a rating. A lot of small factories don't um, have audits because it costs a lot for them to um, have them. But another question you might ask are what are the safety checks you put in place? What are the quality checks that you put in place? Um, you know, how do you operate ethically? How do you make sure that, um, you know, they would be some of the things, but an audit, you know, because a lot of the factories that you might be looking for may not have audits, but if they're a medium to large size factory, then they, then they would. Um, obviously you would want to know the cost of the products and, um, let me just move that chat. Um, so, and what are the quality checks the factory do on the product? So they, the, the product should be checked at different times, um, depending on what that product is. So this is, if you're, these are questions, the, co the quality checks and the audits are if you're doing something that is um, exclusive to you. Um, okay. And the testing as well. I mean, and you may ask that just because you're interested in it for, for products that are, you're buying white label. Um, but again, depending on what product you're buying will depend on what kind of tests that they do on the products. And if you're not sure on what tests you should do, just ask them what are the general tests that people do um, on the products. Let me just so move it back. And who else they supply? So this gives you an idea. And sometimes they'll be able to share that with you. Sometimes they won't. This gives you an idea of where are they pitched from a product point of view and also from a pricing. So if you're, um, if you want to create a brand that's more like a, a whistles price point and they supply, um, and they supply Gucci, they supply um, Bauman, they supply Marc Jacobs, it's probably, it may not be the right, it's probably not the right fit for you because they're just a more an expensive supplier using more expensive raw materials, maybe a higher skilled workforce. So it just helps give you an idea of um, where they where they are pitched, and who would you be dealing with on a day to day basis? So how was the account managed? There are just some things for you to think about. Um, so and some of the things that a supplier may need from you, and this is not. A checklist this is not everything that they'll need because all suppliers are different but they might need a purchase order some suppliers will take an email they might need bought samples so if you are saying oh i want you to make this and i want it to be exactly this weight and i want this fragrance whatever so if i say if i wanted to get this candle made and i wanted to and i loved the fragrance i really like the the vessel and i wanted some something similar then i'd be sending that out to the supplier um so they might need bought samples. If you're, they may need, if you're talking about clothing, they might need a tech pack or a bag. Um, I'll go through what check box are in a minute. They'll need to know what quantity you want to buy. They may need a design brief from you. They may need a design and they may need a costing target or, or a retail target. Um, just with giving them a costing target, I wouldn't do that very, very much at the beginning. That's something once you've established that they're the right supplier for you. It just gets to things quicker, but I probably wouldn't give them a costing target right at the beginning because you might be giving them, they might come in a lot lower. They might come in, have come in lower than that target, but they just give you the target, if you know what I mean. Um, so hold off on giving them a costing target. But I, once I, when I was working for Primark, I knew what the suppliers kind of prices were. So I would give them costing targets to like, this is where you need to be on this. So it just saved a lot of time. Um, and then Namila's question about do you recommendations for sustainably focused UK made dropship manufacturers? Um, you've got quite a couple of different things there, but I would say um, have a look at Make It British and um, they have a directory on there depending on what you are looking for. Okay. So a tech pack if you're doing clothing is is basically like an architect's plans. It's a blueprint for a design or a garment technologist to work from. It has all the instructions and it gives you that finished garment um, a lot easier, quicker. It includes all everything that they need to know, that the factory would need to know. And it helps save costs. It acts as your insurance policy because if, if you get something through when the fit's completely wrong, you say, well, did you not, it doesn't look like that on the tech path, then that's down to the suppliers to sort out. But if you've not given them a tech pack in the, the beginning, you can have a lot of back and forth, waste a lot of time. So a tech pack from with a designer 
can cost around £200 a per item for them to do. Um, but it will save you time and money in the long run if you if it's something that you want to do. But also, you know, if you've got a bought sample, you could send them the bought sample. You might buy two, you keep one, you send them one. Depends how many um, samples and suppliers you're dealing with. It might just be more cost effective for you to get a designer to do a tech pack for you. Um, or if you're dealing with a supplier that has lots of products that you're going to buy from off the shelf or that they can source from you, you might send them a design board. Um, so if you're looking at homewares products, so um, you might say, this is the kind of look and feel I want. This is lingerie. Um, so if you're dealing with new suppliers, you might say, this is the kind of thing I want. Is this the kind of thing you do? Can you show me some photographs of what you've got? It helps, again, speed up that process. If you can give them an idea of what you're looking for, and then you'll know if they are the right supplier for you as well. So what goes into, let me just check on where we are on time. Okay, so what goes into a your costs and your quantities and what goes into a price? So you've got the fabric and the raw materials, you have labor, um, and that's why, depending on where you're sourcing, that's a big part of the cost. So if you're buying something from the UK, you've got a higher labor cost versus then if you're buying something from China. Your trims, so your buttons, your zips, your, your packaging, your labeling, um, your shipping and logistics. So they would be things like your duty. So anything that you're bringing into the UK from um, the Far East or now from Europe, has um, a customs sorry customs duty on it and that varies depending on what that is varies so if you go on to gov.uk i think it is and you just search um customs quotas or just go into google and search customs quotas um you'll be able they'll bring up a whole different load of tariffs and you just have to put in your product types of right okay what kind of percentage am i going to be paying on that um Obviously, the company needs to make a profit, so the, they'll be putting in their profit into their price. And then other expenses that you need to think about as well is um, that you might want to add into the cost would be, right, how much does it cost me to sample this? How much am I going to spend on my marketing? How much is the testing of the product being costed? Um, am I going to use a fulfillment company or am I going to do this myself? So you've got the the fabric the raw materials the labor the trims your packaging shipping and logistics and the profit of the manufacturing organization that goes into the cost of the product that you know they might send um but then you have to think of right what are the other things that i need to make sure are covered in my prices that i'm going to give to the sell to the consumer um, and then you've got your costings and quantities so this is how you work out a profit margin so um, you have got your, your re if a coat retails for 117 pounds, so that's your retail selling price and your cost price is 30, then your gross margin is 87 pounds 50. And then usually that is expressed as a percentage. So, um, and if you, that's your formula there to give you what your profit margin percentage is. Um, and depending on your business model, you're gonna want between a 50 to 80% profit margin. So if you're planning on wholesaling, your own brand, then you need about 75 to 80% profit margin. So that enables everyone to have a piece of the pie um, from a profit point of view. And then if you're thinking about what kind of quantity should I buy? So it depends on how big your audience is and how engaged they are. If you don't have an audience yet, I would definitely start as low as you can and, um, and start your social media as soon as you can to try and get that audience. Um, you know, it will vary as well, depending on what your minimum quantity is by the supplier, how quickly you can repeat an order. You know, if you can repeat an order in two weeks, then you don't need to be holding all of your stock in, in all of your money in stock. So what you really need to do is assess the risk and the cash flow of the business. And then thinking also as well about your packaging and your products. Often packaging has a higher minimum quantity than, um, than your product might have. So you might get them to hold that packaging for you and you, you use that as you, you fill it essentially. So imagine if this, if this candle, if I go back to this candle, I can buy 200 units of it, but for the packaging, I need to buy 500. Then you could buy 500 of the boxes, get them to keep them there. Um, and then you can call off it as and when you need it. So. Okay. And then thinking about where, you know, if you, where are you going to sell it? So if you've got one outlet to sell it on, on your website, so, you know, um, and you think, right, I can sell this over 10 weeks. I think I'm going to sell 10 a week. Then you're looking at um, 100 units. So I'm just going to go through this a little bit quickly. Uh, you will have the slides 
um, you can, um, so you won't have the slides, but you'll have a replay anyway. And if anyone, has, like I said, if there's anyone particular questions that we don't get to, um, then you can DM me on Instagram. Um, yeah, so this is just an example of, you know, if you've got, if you want to sell 10 units and you think you're going to sell it over 20 weeks, then that's 200 units. But you just really need to keep an eye on what your sales are, because if you're, if you only start selling five units of it, that means you're going to have it for 40 weeks. And if it's a t-shirt or something summary, then you need to take some action to, to reduce it, to, to promote it, uh, to make sure that you're kind of getting through it. So keep it lean. What you don't want to all of your product tied up in stock. Um, think of how many you're going to sell per week, your customer, uh, the lead time of the supplier, and um, only need only order what you need to, and just making sure because what happens with a lot of businesses is you know their cash flow is what causes their problem for them. They might be doing really well, but they've got loads of things tied up in stock, and they've got maybe money tied up in the wrong stock. Um, and then you think about critical path management. So critical path is all of the tasks that need to be done from when the order is placed to when the order is delivered. So you need to understand with your supplier, if you're doing things that are made to order, what are all the different processes? When do they need approval from you for everything to stay on track? So what you would ask them to do is send them a critical path, understanding when the testing and the QC checks happen. You know, so what are their trigger dates that they need or that they have in place? So this is just kind of an example of what might happen with the critical path. You send the purchase order or the email, say, yep, go ahead. Supplier sources materials, the initial sampling starts. They, you approve a sample um, or you reject a sample. It goes on to the next stage. Once samples are all approved, the production begins and then they send you a sample um, before it's shipped. So make sure that you get samples before they're shipped if you're dealing with stuff that is own brand um, and also white label because, you know, you might be changing, you'll be, doing it with your packaging. Okay. So make sure when you're dealing with suppliers that you're proactive, proactive, you're addressing the issues and challenges as problems they arise. Don't behind, hide behind emails, picking up the phone to suppliers and building that rapport and with the brands and with suppliers is, is really key as well. Um, make sure that you understand what are they gonna be doing? What are you gonna be doing? And um, also that you're both like I said, that then if there's any contracts in place as well. Um, and I would recommend, depending on what you're doing, um, if it, if you're buying white label from an established band, they'll, they will have contracts in place. If you aren't, um, if it's something that you're buying from a supplier, you might want to put some kind of T's and C's in place. There's a website called Rocket Lawyer, which you can look at some generic TNCs, but there's also a a company called Jameson Law, which I'll put in the chat here. So uh, they're great at contracts and uh, terms and conditions that um, that are specific to you as well. So I would recommend for you to, to look them up. Um, so yeah, be clear on who your audience is and what they want. Decide on where you are positioned in the market. It is a lot of research and putting things together, costing it out, getting the cost of the of the duties of the packaging and all that kind of thing to see, right, where is the best country for me to buy this product from? Because you might have a cheaper product, you might have a cheaper cost price from China, but when you work through all of the costs and the freight and the duty that you need to add on, are you better sourcing that from Europe or the UK? And that's why you need to, you know, explore a couple of different options. And then, um, and just keep at it because it does it does take a while and you'll get knockbacks and people won't answer and, but, you know, keep, keep motoring through. Um, Thanks very much for watching and for interacting and for your questions that have come through. Find me on Instagram, get in touch and um, look forward to connecting with you on there as well. Thank you.